Welcome to the Tech Talks Daily Podcast, where you can learn and be inspired by real-world examples of how technology is transforming businesses and reshaping industries in a language everyone can understand. Here is your host, Neil C. Hughes. Welcome back to the Tech Talks Daily Podcast. Man, have I got a great story for you, because Greg Johnson from Invoca is going to be joining us on the show. And he's an expert on helping businesses use data to gain insights into the buyer journey to improve customer experience and increase revenue. And he's got a great story to share. He was a former Salesforce exec turned CEO of Invoca, who has just led the company through its first acquisition of Dialogue Tech and through the release of its second product, Invoca for Sales. But I want to learn more about Invoca's technology, how it's used in the contact centre to help B2C companies deliver customer experiences that drive sales. And I also want to try and bring to life what happens on the other side of the phone call when any of us call a contact centre and understand how data is powering those interactions and why interactions are improving and how businesses can keep that momentum going. So buckle up. And hold on tight as I beam your ears all the way to California, where Greg Johnson is waiting to speak with us now. So a massive warm welcome to the show. Can you tell the listeners a little about who you are and what you do? Sure. So Greg Johnson, I'm the CEO of Invoca. We're a US-based company um, that focuses on digital marketing, sales, and customer experience. I've been CEO at Invoca for just about five years now. And before that, Spent about a decade in product and marketing roles at Salesforce. And prior to that, kind of bounced around between really tiny software startups and uh, also doing consulting work at um, BCG for some of the biggest software companies in the world. So I've spent, gosh, date myself, almost 20, 25 years in the software world now. Wow. And I'm glad you mentioned uh, Salesforce there, because before you came on, it was my understanding that Invoca is a Salesforce-backed company that enterprises like Allstate and Frontier Airlines used to extract intelligence from phone calls. But for anyone that is listening today and hearing about you guys for the first time, can you just offer a bit of an overview of, of exactly what it is and the kind of problems that you solve and ultimately what makes it different from other solutions out there? Yeah, of course. So uh, at Invoca, we work with um, primarily B2C companies that focus on interacting with consumers. And they're uh, oftentimes in industries or categories that have relatively complex products or services to buy or purchase. So you think about telecommunications, which you mentioned, travel and hospitality, healthcare, financial services. And in these industries, consumers Um, often want consultative guidance as part of the buying process. They want to feel confident they're buying the right product. You think about getting a mortgage for the first time you buy an apartment, a condominium or home, or you think about dealing with a sensitive healthcare issue. And so for these consumers, as they learn more about the products and services that a brand has to offer, uh, oftentimes they'll do research on the website, but then at some point they want to engage with an expert and they want to get expert advice. And so what we do at Invoca is we really help connect the dots of that journey between digital research and discovery and everything from Facebook and Google to the website to when you as a consumer want to have a conversation um, with somebody about a mortgage or healthcare product, um, really helping bring that experience together to make it seamless for the consumer and also to give the brand a data-driven understanding of those consumer buying behaviors. So understanding at what point did the consumer reach out for buying assistance? Uh, what did they talk about with somebody from your brand? Um, did they actually buy something? If they didn't buy something, are they interested? Are they in market? Is that someone that you should continue to engage with? And so really what we're trying to help uh, these B2C brands do is acquire our customers more effectively, more cost-effectively, and also deliver a better experience so that uh, when a consumer is interacting with you, when they switch from the digital channel to that live expert advice channel, it's not like starting again over from zero and having to sort of reintroduce yourself and re-explain what you're interested in. Um, And so, yeah, we're a Salesforce Ventures backed company. We have, I would say a lot of Salesforce DNA, uh, not only myself, but others in the company and in in our blood and really sit at the world of kind of CRM and customer experience for B2C companies. 
Now, a question that I always like to ask my guests is, after having mm-hmm. learned about the kind of solutions that you're working on and what you do, is how did you get where you are today? So the question I've got to ask is, can you share your origin story and, and what put you on this path you're on today and where your passion for all things tech came from? Um, I think going back to dating myself, I'm yeah. old enough now to recognize what I did right and where I got lucky. <laughs> and I think... <laughs> You know, I sort of stumbled into technology. So um, my undergraduate degree, I studied international relations. I thought I was going to go either teach and do research or potentially go into the foreign service. Um, I did an internship my my junior year of college in, in Athens, Greece at the U.S. Embassy. And as I came out of undergrad, I... Um, I sort of had some doubts, like, well, maybe I should try some other things before I go down that path. So I went into consulting. I did two years of consulting. And then this was in uh, the San Francisco Bay Area in the late 90s in the midst of the first internet boom. And I left to go start a company with a couple of coworkers. And I was the youngest person on the team. We had to build a kind of a product beta to get funded. And so I ended up teaching myself to code. And um I think I really enjoyed the idea of making something like the idea that you could write some code and you could hit a button and like something would happen again and again and again in an automated way. Just, I found really cool. My dad's a mechanical engineer. So I think there's a little bit of an engineering DNA in my blood. And I just really love that idea of creating something and sort of the idea of the internet, letting you create something that has sort of the infinite scale and can be used by infinite number of people. And I just got really excited about software. And then from there on out, um, all my professional career has been in software. I still love international relations. I got a graduate degree in international relations sort of for the intellectual fun of it, um, along with an MBA. But I've, I've just been really fortunate to work with some great companies in the software space. And I think just have really been personally interested in the way that software is changing the world. And obviously, the sort of commercial opportunities and career opportunities that offers you, I've been very, very fortunate. And that path, of course, led you to Invoca, where you recently led the company through its first acquisition. I think it was a dialogue tech and through the yep. release of its second product, Invoca for Sales. It must have been an incredibly exciting time for you. It's been a crazy 18 months, and not only because of COVID. Um, you know, it's funny, we as a company, we we've always been fairly multi-location. We have, like, if you look at the leadership team, even before our acquisition, Uh, We have members of our executive team in Southern California, Northern California, and Denver, Colorado in the U.S. Um, And so, yeah, we were at a point where um, we were thinking about, you know, continuing to grow. And a lot of software companies, an important step for them is going from being a single product company to a multi-product company. That's a very big sort of transition point. And so for us, we'd always worked very closely with B2C marketers. We'd always help them think about Uh, How do they spend their marketing dollars um, more effectively in terms of digital advertising the website? It was a very logical extension for us to think about if I, as a marketer, am driving conversations between a consumer and my brand team, um, how do we as a a software provider help you sort of finish that job? And finishing that job entails helping improve the conversations that your sales teams are having with these consumers. And we had built a lot of the AI technology to literally transcribe audio to text in real time during these conversations to understand what the consumer was saying, what the agent was saying, to understand key buying signals and behaviors in that process. And it was very obvious to us that a way to help our customers even more was to give them feedback to their agents and help them use technology to pinpoint where those agents were having great conversations with consumers and where they could get better. And the pandemic accelerated all this because B2C contact centers traditionally have been co-located in one location. You did a lot of work with teams. The managers worked very closely with supervisors. But in the pandemic, everybody had to work from home. And so you had to find new ways to use technology um, to, to help your contact center agents be more effective. And this is an area, contact centers have very high turnover on the order of 30 to 35% of your year. So you're constantly training new people. You need to give them advice on best practices. You need to see how you can help them. And so it was a great opportunity for us to, to sort of expand what we were doing from just marketing to also sales to help those marketing and sales teams work together with a common set of data, common understanding of what was working. So uh, we embarked uh, about 18 months ago on building our product for sales teams. We introduced that about three or four months ago. I've had great reception from customers. 
And then um, on your second point around the acquisition, yes, all Invoca's development to date has been organic. Um, and we've had a very strong product and engineering team. And we had gotten to know the team through Dialogue Tech, actually through a Salesforce connection. So uh, the CEO of Dialogue Tech, his brother is a longtime Salesforce executive that I had worked with during my time at Salesforce. So there's a good personal connection. Um, so the entire M&A transaction was done over Zoom, <laughs> but it was good that there was a pre-existing in real life connection between the CEO and I. And we just started talking about the things that we were trying to accomplish. And we found that a lot of our vision had a lot of overlap. And so uh, we thought it was a great opportunity to bring the teams together. You know, it's very rare that you get an opportunity to essentially double your engineering team with a bunch of engineers that have worked on the same problems and, and have similar understanding as to what you were doing. And so we felt like it was a way to really accelerate the solutions we could bring to market for customers. Um, and, you know, despite the fact that up until almost the very end, it was all done via Zoom and all done remotely, um, it's gone really well. I think there's a lot of cultural affinity between the Dialogue Tech team and the Invoca team. So it's made it very easy from a transition point of view on how the teams work together. And it is an exciting space at the moment because it's often said that the customer experience has become the new battlefield. I'm curious, how big a role do you think voice plays in that? And do you think that our obsession with technology and with that, we've almost forgotten about the power of voice? I think one of the things that the pandemic, I think, made everyone realize is how important human connections are and can be and how powerful they can be. Um, I know, from just speaking from personal experience, I was refinancing my mortgage at some point during the pandemic, and I ended up having a conversation with, it was like a back office loan processor type of person. And um, we were working through some things that, you know, she needed some documentation. And I remember at the end of the call, I was like, this is one of the... It's one of the best experiences I've had all day because I'd spent the prior 10 hours in business meetings, you know, just kind of going through things and you just so rarely get to see and meet new people. And so I think we saw a surge of um, people reaching out to brands uh, during the pandemic, um, looking to build those relationships. I think what's also interesting is the pandemic drove a lot of buying activity online. And obviously, if you're selling, you know, T-shirts that cost ten dollars, seven pounds, something like that, like it's very easy to buy that online. Yeah. But if you think about these more complicated products, these are very important life decisions, right? Like a mortgage is really about the biggest financial investment most people make. Uh, you think about healthcare and how critical that is to, to people, and how important it's been in the last two years. And these are areas of the idea of buying with confidence is really, really important. Not only do people want to make the right decision, they need to feel that they've made the right decision. They want to have confidence that they've made the right decision. And so I think figuring out ways to deliver that human connection, that value added touch during the buying experience in a world where you can't walk into a storefront really became a big challenge. And so we saw a lot of surges in sort of person to person interactions over the past year is these B2C brands had to figure out other ways to deliver that value added expertise in a world where they couldn't physically, you know, have their employees interact with consumers. So many great points in that. And before you came on the podcast today, I came across uh, a report from Invoca that discovered that consumers actually just want to call a contact center with 68% of respondents preferring to speak with a business over the phone than any form of other com uh, communication. And they're enjoying the experience. And 50% of the consumers said that agents are more helpful now than they, they were before March 2020. Can you expand on those findings? Yeah, I mean, I think... Um it's funny because everybody thinks uh, the phone call and the live human conversation is dead in a world yeah. of, you know, messaging and Facebook messenger and WhatsApp and all those things. Um, and I think the reality is companies need to offer their consumers choice for how they want to interact with the, the company and the brand. And I think people often forget that different types of interactions involve different channels. So the example I always like to use is I think about financial services. Like if I'm checking a stock price on the FTSE or if I am looking at my bank account balance, like I don't want to talk to a human being to do that. Like I can do that, I can do that over my phone all day long yeah. just by doing some stuff. But if I'm trying to figure out um, you know, my retirement plan 
or if I'm thinking about, uh, you know, life insurance or heaven forbid, I live in California, we have to think about, you know, earthquake insurance and fire insurance and all these complicated things that speak to the heart of like my family and my home and all these things, you know, getting that value added interaction is hugely important. And, and I think people don't realize how much consumers want that they, they don't want it in every situation, right? Like, um, it's not to say that like you should abandon your website and just interact with people via phone, mm -hmm. but conversely, you definitely, especially if you're in one of these complicated industry industries should not abandon the phone and assume that everything is going to happen through your website because there's either segments of the population or people at specific points in the journey where they really want that value added interaction. And so I think what brands need to do is think about how can they empower their contact center agents to deliver a great interaction, to get as much as information as they can. So when you do interact with someone on the phone, I'm not sitting here going, okay, Neil, you know, what's your address again? Like that kind of stuff is not value added. You need to use technology to automate as much of that as possible. But when people are making important buying decisions, they want to do that with confidence. The example I use and, and the more of the t-shirt example is like, think about when I go to Amazon now, even I'm buying a $15 good, like I read all these reviews to, and, and, and that $15 good, I can send it back at no cost anytime I want. Like it's super low friction, yet I still spend time reading reviews because there's this intrinsic desire to feel like you're making the right purchase decision. And I think in these complicated things, like if you're taking a 25th wedding anniversary trip to Africa to go on safari, like that is not returnable. Like if you don't <laughs> like that experience, you can't go backwards. And so I think that's an idea where like speaking to somebody and saying, hey, this is the experience I want. This is what I'm looking for and helping consumers make that decision. In those situations, a human channel of communication is absolutely irreplaceable. And so I think brands have gotten so focused on digital transformation, they've sort of forgotten how can you use digital technology to help deliver that amazing human to human connection? Because that can still be a huge value add in these critical parts of the customer journey. And I think that's what the data and the research that we've done shows at these, at these specific points in the journey. So Invoca's technology is used in contact centers to help B2C companies deliver co that customer experience that, that drives sales ultimately. But do you, do you have any use cases that you can share that will just bring to life the, the value that that kind of tech can, can offer business? Yeah, and we really, we sort of sit at the intersection of marketing and the contact center. I'll give you two use cases to help you understand. So. Um, a lot of marketers at these companies, they spend a lot of budget these days on Google and Facebook and Microsoft being some of these other platforms because you know digital marketing and advertising gives marketers ways to, to reach consumers in a very targeted way, but also in a very quantifiable way, right? Like the, the famous adage about advertising is, I know that you know half of my advertising works, I just don't know which half. And, and part of the beauty of digital advertising has been, it gives you a very granular level of data and feedback around what's working and what's not. So you can make better use of your budget. The problem has been is that aspect of digital advertising works really well if you transact online. If you buy online, you can see the impact of advertising and on purchases. But if you buy over the phone or you buy through a conversation with someone, traditionally you've lost a lot of that ability. So what Invoca helps these marketers do is understand when we they, they reach people through Google or Facebook campaigns that they're paying for and they drive them to the website. But it helps them understand when they actually drive them to buy through these consultative experiences, they get data on that. So they can see how they're impacting that and make smarter decisions as opposed to flying blind. And the contact center side of things, um, a lot of times, you know, at a big B2C company, the marketing team and the contact center team is like the right hand and the left hand. Like they really aren't that well coordinated. And so you'll have things like the marketing teams, like spending a lot more money on campaigns to drive inbound sales conversations. The contact center doesn't know. Suddenly the contact center phone's ringing off the hook. There are people calling in that the marketing team has spent money to drive to have buying conversations with the contact center. But what they don't realize is the contact center maybe over capacity, they can't get to the phones. So those calls are being unanswered. Um, and basically it's marketing dollars in the rubbish bin. Or, um, you know, the, the contact center agents don't have a full appreciation of what marketing offers are going out into market. So they get on the phone with people and they're having conversations. They're not fully equipped to answer questions in the right way. And so Invoca's technology 
helps identify when these sort of misalignments or gaps or data issues occur, and then helps bring those teams together so that they can solve them and so that they can fix them. So like we see with telcos, some of the telcos we work with in the US and Canada, sometimes 20 to 30% of the inbound sales inquiries that those teams are getting aren't being answered, which is again, is marketing dollars going to waste, or they're getting lots of questions and conversations around customer service issues, which are very important, but it's great to identify those and then look back at where are we spending marketing dollars driving conversations with existing customers around, you know, how do I fix my router and my house versus where am I driving net new commercially oriented conversations around, I need to upgrade my internet service because I've got three kids zooming from home all the time and I'm on calls at work and I need much better internet access. So providing that data link so that marketing and sales can work more closely together is really, really where Invoke is focused. And for consumers listening everywhere, like you said a few moments ago, you don't want to be ringing up and wasting time giving name and address details, etc. Let's give people listening a chance to take a peek behind the curtain of what happens on the other side of the phone call when we call that call center. How is data powering those inter- interactions that we don't yeah. automatically think of? Yeah, and I think um, one of the things that's interesting is when people think about the contact center, they often think about existing customers and customer service. And so traditionally what that has meant is, you know, if I've been a customer of a financial services company for four or five years, that financial services company tends to know a lot about me, right? Like they know my home address, they know my phone number, they know all the stuff about my banking information. In those situations, it's about combining all of that data, getting it in front of the agent as soon as possible in an automated way so that the, the brand is not asking you to repeat things. That's what people get really frustrated about, especially when you get transferred from one person to another. Yeah. Um, the situations that we're working with most B2C brands on is not actually with existing customers, but with new customers and with people that they don't really know. And so then what it's really about is how do you get the agent, the data, around you know what the user has been doing online so again let me go back to financial services if i you know go and i'm looking on a website and i'm doing a bunch of research around refinancing my mortgage and i'm looking at a mortgage calculator around you know if i refinance at this rate versus that rate how much does it save on my monthly payment when i then start to have a conversation with uh, a loan advisor you don't really want to start with, are you looking to buy a home or are you looking to refinance your existing mortgage? Like without any personal identifiable data or anything super secret, right? Like I've sort of signaled on the website, I'm interested in refinancing my mortgage. And so like, let's not waste 30 seconds on understanding, am I trying to purchase or am I trying to refinance? Like, is there a way to look at that web browsing behavior and start the conversation in a more value added way with, Hello, Neil. Um, are you interested in refinancing your mortgage today? Yes. Okay. Well, then I would think about these three or four things as you go about doing that. And so for us, a lot of times um, we're sitting right at the border of technically what people kind of call anonymous versus uh, authenticated users. Like you're coming from the world where literally the brand knows nothing about you other than what you've been doing on the website to you as a consumer, you're reaching out to the brand, you're asking for help. And now you're starting to get to be a known user and it's sort of like how do you piece together that data and use it in a way that delivers a better experience for the consumer uh, so that they aren't repeating a bunch of stuff that they've sort of already signaled either online or to a prior agent and i suspect although this five thousand miles uh, difference between us i would imagine that over the last 18 months we've both called a business of some description wanting help have to sit through a two-minute warning about because of covid was going to be a two-hour wait while you you're waiting on hold we've seen those bad examples but do you have any examples of how interactions are improving and how businesses yeah. keep that momentum going yeah well i mean i think it, it's really um i think about contact center conversations as sort of like pipelines that you need to to be moving as effectively as possible so there's uh, an american telecommunications company that we work with called viasat and viasat focuses on satellite TV and or satellite internet access. And they they also, so their kind of their sweet spot is not in downtown metropolitan areas where there are lots of options for getting internet service um, from sort of traditional telecom providers with big fiber internet, all that sort of things. Their focus tends to be at Viasat more on rural areas that don't have those same access. And so for Viasat, what's really interesting is um, is, is they would market over a broad area. They're, they're really trying to pinpoint 
who are the right consumers for us, which is not someone living in a downtown urban area, it's somebody out in a rural area. And um, trying to sort of separate the wheat from the chaff in terms of who is a useful prospect that they are likely to win versus who is someone that has a, a bunch of other options that may be more cost-effective given where they live. And so during the pandemic, Viasat used Invoca technology um, to kind of delineate where callers were calling from. And when they knew that they had a consumer that was calling from a serviceable area where they had a very uh, differentiated offering, they would change their queuing of those people and get to them faster. And then for people who didn't uh, have, where they really didn't have a competitive offering, um, instead of having them wait on hold for five minutes only to learn, oh, you're not really in a serviceable area, they would use Invoca data to help understand where those consumers were calling from. And they would automatically route them to another provider that had a better offering for them based on their geography. And so what they were able to do is they were able to take this massive amount of inbound demand that they were getting because of COVID and sort of manage that pipeline more effectively so they could better serve their customers and they could more profitably leverage their contact center to really focus on where they could have value added either customer support or sales conversations and not waste time on consumers calling from areas that frankly, they just couldn't really serve. Um, and so they were able to dramatically expand uh, their sales capacity and without having to add a lot of headcount just by more efficiently managing that queuing and kind of pipeline of, of contact center conversations. And before you came on the podcast today, I read a great quote from you. I think you said, customer conversations have been an underutilized yet valuable data source for marketers as they seek to understand me and even predict the subtlest of consumer needs and intent. So brands will need to differentiate themselves from their competition by leveraging rich insights from conversations to optimize digital marketing investments and ultimately improve customer experiences. But so do you think that businesses that don't keep that momentum going and continue to frustrate their customers will get left behind or are they already left behind? Well, yeah, I mean, I think, you know, everybody is so focused on customer experience because like, the marketplace is more competitive than ever. Yeah. Um, we see technology is breaking down barriers between different industries. And, and so you have new entrants coming in who aren't, you know, if you think about like financial services, new technology enabled firms are doing things that traditional banks have never been able to do. And so I think customer experience is definitely a key area of focus and understanding your consumer is critical. And it's funny, you think about, you know, today, anytime we go on a website, you know, typically at the end of our web browsing session, we'll get a little pop-up link. That's like, tell me about your experience. What did you like? What did you did not like? And I don't know, maybe one person out of a hundred or one person out of a thousand will take the time to actually fill that out and tell you what they think. And then you think about the fact that you have consumers talking with people from your brand every single day, every minute, every hour, and all that feedback is going, for the most part, underutilized, underanalyzed. And so the great thing about technology today is technology can help you understand those conversations at scale in a, in a more automated way. Um, and you don't have to sit there and listen to you know, 500,000 conversations that happen with your company and your consumers every day. You can use technology to scan those find outliers, either positive or negative, and then really look to understand issues. And so I think the, these live conversations that are happening between consumers or brands are amazing source of feedback and amazing uh, source of understanding what's happening in your market with your competition. Is your competition offering uh, products and services or discounts that you aren't? How do you need to react? And all this information has just been lying there waiting for us to use it. Technology has finally caught up and made that scalable with AI and some of these things. And so I think Companies that are responsive to consumers, regardless of what technologies and tactics they use, companies that are responsive to consumers are going to win. And I think this is an area where there's a lot of rich data on how you can be more responsive to your consumers and get ahead in the market. And if we look to the future, obviously voice search at the moment on devices such as Amazon Echo, Apple Siri, Google Home, et cetera, is, is set to explode. I mean, do you think there's a need for analytics around voice uh, over the next few years? And is that something that interests you at Invoker too? Oh, yeah, I definitely I definitely think so. And I think what what's interesting, my own view has sort of evolved on this in the past few years. I, I think um, when Alexa and Google Home and all these things first came out four or five years ago, I think there was such a level of enthusiasm around them that it was like, oh, they're going to do everything. And I don't actually think that's true. I think there are, there are things that voice is very fundamentally good at. 
So if you think about it as an input mechanism, um, you know, you can, you can actually speak roughly 90, a hundred words a minute. Most, most people on average. Um, but you think about reading, like you can read 200 words a minute. And so you can read faster than you can speak or that, that other people can speak. And so I think what we're seeing is this interplay between there are certain things that voice is really good at. And then there are certain things that display and written elements are really good at. And I think this is why you see some of the kind of bigger devices like the echo show or the combination of both voice and, and speech and, and reading. Um, but I think everybody's realizing what a great natural, easy way to communicate voice is the issue is then how do you use that data and, and how do you present that data and give it back to consumers in the most fungible way? And so I think voice search, what you find is that on Google and other things, you know, instead of typing things in, people are just going onto their devices and being like, hey, like, find me the closest blah, 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 blah. Um, I think what hasn't taken off as much is the idea of voice input with voice results on search, because I don't think people really want to sit here and be like, the top five pharmacies near you are a, like, it just takes too long to do that. Yeah. As opposed to if I use voice as an input and then I can look at a map and I can scan it literally in two seconds or less and be done. Um, so I think our sort of understanding of how voice is going to be used is continuing to evolve. But I think technology is enabling new use cases that were just unfathomable four or five, six years ago, which is why we love what we do, right? Like one of the reasons I joined Invoca is I loved and had spent time at Salesforce trying to think about how do you make sense out of unstructured conversational data? Because I think it's such a rich data source. And I think we learn something new every month, every quarter, every year around where voice is going and how it's going to be used in the future to deliver better customer experiences. Love that. And I love chatting with you today. I'd love it to get you back on and talk about how that journey continues to evolve. But before we do, we started the conversation today talking about your origin story. Now I'm going to have a bit of fun with you and ask you what the soundtrack to that origin story was. Is there a piece of music or a song that has inspired <laughs> you throughout your career that we can put on a Spotify playlist and help inspire others too? Is there a song I... or a story? Yeah, I'm trying to think. I don't know if there's a song that's inspired me throughout my career. I've kind of weird and eclectic musical taste. So I, I go and I vary from month to month and quarter to quarter. I tell you one of my favorite recent ones, and it's probably because it's summertime and I'm used to being outside. Um, but I grew up and I my dad loved jazz. My dad, uh, he had one of those old reel to reel devices oh. where you, and he would record jazz series on the radio. So like my founding memories of growing up with my dad, uh, or listening to jazz. And um, in my adult life, I've, I really enjoy reggae and ska and dub and world music. And so um, I found this really interesting uh, version of Take Five, like the classic West Coast jazz Dave Brubeck uh, song um, by a guy named King Tubby, who's a Jamaican uh, producer, sound engineer. And so it's sort of like classic West Coast jazz meets um, dub and reggae. Oh, and uh, and because it's summer, and, and I always say, like, for my own mentality and for the people I work with, like, if we hire the right people, I need to tell people to slow down, not to speed up. Like, the best people that I work with, I need to tell them it's going to be okay, de-stress, take a break, you don't need to push yourself harder. And so I think of I think of King Tubby's version of Take Five in the same way. It's kind of, for me, it's like a detox relax. It's not a pump you up song. Yeah, it's yeah. more of a, like, ah, okay, like, I need to, I need to just relax for a minute. Um so yeah, I would I wouldn't say that is my it's not my it's not my go on stage inspiration. It's my take a step back, take a deep breath, stop running so hard, get collection like get calm collected, chill, and then kind of move forward type of thing. Oh so, man, I love that. And I've not heard that version, so I'm gonna check that out for it's, myself. It's I you know, I and I can't remember how I uh I stumbled on it. And it was funny, I was on Twitter a month or two ago, and I don't remember what it was. It was something about jazz and somebody, maybe, I don't think Dave Brubeck passed, but it was something around Dave Brubeck and Take Five. And uh, I was like, if you think, if you like that version, check out this version, because it's just very, very, very different. So yeah, add it to your playlist and we'll see. Yeah, you man, that's going straight on. But before I let you go, if anyone wanted to find out more information about Invoca, the work you're doing, your technology, or contact your team, what's the best starting point? Yeah, just www.invoca.com. It's I-N-V-O-C-A.com. Um, easy to find online. I'm on Twitter at Greg underscore Johnson, G-R-E-G-G underscore J-O-H-N-S-O-N. Um, and like, I love customer experience, CRM, conversations, voice, like all those topics. 
we love to explore, we love to talk about. So welcome any feedback or any conversations that people want to have and appreciate the time today, Neil. Well, I cannot thank you enough for coming on and bringing to life what's happening on the other side of the phone call when we contact a call center, how data is powering those interactions, why interactions are improving, and how businesses can keep that momentum going. But more than anything, for sharing your story and the soundtrack to that story too. Thanks for joining me today, Greg. Take care. Have a good weekend. Wow, we covered so much ground in a short amount of time there. Loved hearing Greg's story, a cracking song choice for our Spotify playlist and also learning more about voice tech, where it's going, and what really goes on when we call a call centre. What goes on behind the scenes and the technology that is improving that industry. And of course, what happens to the businesses that don't improve that experience and offer a poor experience when we call, when we just want to speak with someone and end up waiting on hold or navigating through complex phone menus. Food for thought indeed. But over to you, please. I want you to share your experiences. If you have any questions, if you want to come on the podcast, whatever it may be, simply email me, techblogwriteroutlook.com, tweet me at Neil C. Hughes, LinkedIn and Instagram at Neil C. Hughes. And my website is techblogwriter.co.uk. But that's it for today's episode. So a big thank you for joining me as always. And I hope you'll come along for the ride again tomorrow. So a big thank you for listening. And until next time, don't be a stranger. Thank you for listening to the Tech Talks Daily Podcast with Neil C. Hughes. Remember, technology works best when it brings people together.